second recording is going to be on and then you can yeah go ahead max um okay uh uh, welcome everyone to uh, the Sheffield uh, University Philosophy Departmental Seminar. Uh, and it's our great pleasure uh, today to welcome Professor Lara Valentini, um, who is at uh, Ludwig Maximilians Universität in Munich, uh, where she specializes in um, political, legal, and moral philosophy. Professor Valentini is the author of Justice in a Globalized World, a Normative Framework, and today will be speaking to us on the topic of a topic that is close to the hearts of many people uh, in this department, actually, uh, normative powers. All right, so uh, thank you very much, Max, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for uh, being here, for the invitation, and for attending the seminar. I am now going to show you my slides, hopefully. OK, present now my entire screen. Allow, presumably. And now uh, get this up and right. So I know that everyone's mic is muted, but can I have some verbal confirmation that you're seeing see normative powers, the title? Can you see normative yeah? powers? <laughs> well, I mean, uh, just read it on your screen. Yep. Hello? Yes, we can see, we can yeah, see the okay, slides. Sorry. Yeah, it's just the thing that I can't see anyone's faces. I can't, I don't get any non audio feedback of what's going on. All right. So the title of my talk, as you know, is normative powers. Uh, let me start off by uh, giving you a bunch of little examples or scenarios. So here's one. Anna asks John whether she can use his pen to take some notes and John smiles and nods. Oh, Julie tells her employee, Stella, these papers need to be processed by the end of the week. Or Tom says to his son, Billy, I promise to help you with your homework once I'm back from work tonight. And Carl says about his wife, this is a slightly more dramatic scenario, in front of his family, yes, Maria has cheated on me, but I forgive her. I have also not been the perfect husband. None of us is perfect. We should all remember that. Now, these are clearly rather disparate and different scenarios, but they all have something, something in common. That is, the individuals who are the protagonists of these scenarios all do something that makes a difference to the relevant normative situation. So by smiling and nodding, John consents to Anna taking his pen and thereby removes a prohibition that was placed on Anna prior to his consent. Uh, by telling her employee to process the papers, Stella issues a command and thereby place, uh, sorry, Stella, Julie issues a command and thereby places Stella under an obligation to actually process the papers within the required time frame. By making a promise to his son, Billy, Tom binds himself to help Billy with the homework in the evening and thereby Billy acquires a right that he didn't previously have to his father's help. And by forgiving his wife, Carl makes her no longer an appropriate object of blame and arguably, depending on what exactly we think forgiveness entails, um, uh, removes duties that she might have had to make amends. Okay. So these are all examples of what many philosophers describe as normative powers, which allow the holders to act in ways that change the normative situation. But while there is quite a lot of literature, I think, on specific such powers, so there's a big literature on consent, there's a big literature on forgiveness, there's a big literature on promising, there's a big literature on authority, and I'm taking these as paradigmatic instances of normative powers. Of course, they don't exclude uh, the whole category of normative powers. My sense is that there is relatively little on the phenomenon of normative powers as such. And what this paper is trying to do is to make some progress on the phenomenon in its entirety and specifically two dimensions of it. So one is the conceptual dimension. So what the paper will try to do is to offer a well-functioning, hopefully compelling definition of normative powers in general, rather than specific such powers. And then uh, it also uh, focuses on the ontological dimension of normative powers. 
um, asking about the existence conditions of such powers. What does it take for one to possess the powers and exercise them? And the main claim the paper will make in this context um, will be that social practices are a necessary existence condition of normative powers, including moral powers. Um, of course, this leaves open many other things that have to do with the existence conditions of normative powers. I'm saying one thing you need is social practices. So on the ontology side, I'm going to give a partial answer to the question of what it takes. I'm saying one ingredient is social practices. All right. So the structure of the paper kind of follows the two aims quite closely. So the first part of the paper um, is focused on the concept of normative powers. And it has the following, uh, it proceeds in the following steps. First of all, I set out some desiderata for what I think a good definition of normative power should look like. Then I'm going to test existing definitions vis-a-vis -vis those desiderata, and I'm going to suggest that none of them is fully satisfactory, and then I'm going to offer my preferred alternative, which is what I call the constitutive definition. And then I'm going to move on to the ontology of normative powers. Um, I am going to say something very brief about um, what I call de facto normative powers, powers that exist as a matter of social fact but need not have any moral import, and then just zoom in on moral normative powers. And here I'll distinguish between practice-dependent and practice-independent views, and then I'm going to try to convince you that we have a good practice-independent reasons for favoring a practice-dependent view of the ontology of normative powers, and then I will conclude just summing up. Uh, the arguments in the paper. So let me start off with uh, desiderata. So I want to suggest that a good definition of normative powers should satisfy the following desiderata. Uh, one is what I call normative distinctiveness. And this is the idea that the definition that we offer should pick out a distinctive normative phenomenon. Um, ideally not at the cost of being really mysterious. So the thought is something like this. Um, in order to vindicate the idea that we have such things as normative powers and, um, you know, the reason why we're interested in drawing the conceptual boundaries of the notion of normative powers in the first place is that we suspect, I take it, that there is a distinctive phenomenon that can do explanatory work in normative theorizing. Now, if our definition could not vindicate this background idea of suspicion, then it's not clear why we should include normative powers in our normative ontology. Um, if the phenomena we're interested in could be explained without normative powers, uh, if normative powers weren't picking out something distinctive and explanatorily helpful, then, you know, Occam's razor, don't multiply entities unnecessarily, uh, just uh, do away with normative powers. We don't need the category. There has to be something special and explanatorily useful about it. And I call it normative distinctiveness. But of course, not at the cost of sort of postulating something really weird and mysterious, because that could be distinctive, but um, not satisfactory. Second, desideratum is fit. So ideally, the definition we offer should neither over nor under generate normative powers relative to paradigmatic instances of such powers. Then what I call neutrality. So ideally, again, the definition should be neutral with respect to contested questions about the ontology of normative powers. And what I'm suggesting here is that, if possible, we would want our definition not to preempt substantive debates about what it takes to possess and exercise this power or that power. Because if our definition can achieve this, then it can offer a useful common ground on the basis of which we can then inquire into what exactly it takes to ground and possess such powers. So if at all possible, neutral. Otherwise, the moment we offer a definition, um, you know, already there, we'll get lots of theorists who have worked on this or that or the other normative power uh, to jump off board, so to say, and just say, that can't be what a normative power is because, you know, my definition of consent includes, um, I don't know, intention as a necessary condition for the normative power of consent, but your definition doesn't have intention. Therefore, I'm, I'm not even interested in looking at it. And then the final one, which I take to be the weaker, actually, of the four desiderata, the one that can be sacrificed if need be, 
is versatility. And so ideally, I think the definition should allow us to speak of normative powers across legal, social and moral domains. Um, and, you know, the idea is similar to what we see in the context of, for instance, rights relations. So a claim right, I'll just say rights for short, um, is a notion that figures both um, in the legal domain and in the moral domain. And I think ideally we would want a definition that picks out the same kind of structural relation across the two domains while allowing for the fact that the existence conditions of legal rights and those of moral rights are going to differ. But the general definition of a right should hopefully be compatible with both domains. And I'm thinking something similar would be desirable in the case of normative powers, especially given that my impression is the notion of a normative power has been important into the moral domain from the legal domain and specifically often referred to as the Hofeldian 4-4 classification uh, or taxonomy of rights, one of which is powers. Um, that particular notion seems to work quite well in the law, but it also seems to have some uh, uses in moral philosophy and therefore it's been imported there. So if versatile, I think our definition would have um, you know, an advantage over a non-versatile definition. At the same time, if the only way of achieving, say, normative distinctiveness would be via domain-specific definitions, then I think, you know, versatility would have to give. Okay, so these are my desiderata, and now I'm going to test existing definitions. Um, this exercise might be a little bit boring, I'm aware of it, but part of the reason why I engage in it um, is to uh, kind of motivate the definition that I'm then going to offer as the preferred one, at least my preferred one, which is the constitutive definition by showing what problems there might be with definitions that perhaps seem, at least on the surface, more um, straightforward and more plausible. Okay, so the first definition is what I call the voluntary act definition. And it goes as follows, any voluntary act X of an agent A, which uh, affects a change in normative situation, is the exercise of a normative power. And a definition along these lines was um, offered by uh, Wesley Hofeld himself. Now, at first sight, this definition may seem uh, quite appealing to the extent that if we think about paradigmatic instances of normative powers, like power to marry, to consent, uh, make promises, place others under obligation, it looks like they work by changing the normative situation through a voluntary act of the person uh, performing the promise or issuing uh, the command or um, you know, giving their consent and so on and so forth. So at first sight, the definition seems to match the phenomenon of interest, but on reflection, it turns out it doesn't fit. And the reason is that there are many examples we can give that fit the definition, but don't look like paradigmatic examples of normative powers at all. So here's one, but one can come up with a whole um, set of them. If I voluntarily punch you, I incur obligations to make amends, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I change the normative situation. Yet this isn't the exercise of a normative power. Voluntarily punching you in the face, even voluntarily punching you in the face with the intention of incurring obligations to make amends, if for whatever reason my twist in personality is such that um, that's what I want to do, would not typically qualify as the exercise of a normative power. So we have an overgeneration problem. In fact, the overgeneration problem is compounded by a lack of distinctiveness problem. So we can think of a ton of similar cases. So basically, on this definition, every time I voluntarily fulfill the antecedent of a conditional principle of the form, if you do X, then you ought or not to do Y or someone else or ought or ought not to do Y, then I allegedly exercise a normative power. So if I step onto the middle of the road and in so doing, I place an obligation on oncoming traffic to stop because um, you know there's an antecedent principle that says you shouldn't uh, act in ways that are likely to kill other people, I've thereby exercised a normative power. But that's not something particularly distinctive, that's just a very standard feature of morality that somehow a voluntary act come with uh, sort of normative or moral consequence or implications that what we do may activate the demands of independent moral principles. And so 
if this was all there was to normative powers, then there would be nothing particularly special about them. So we have a problem of overgeneration and a lack of distinctiveness. So maybe let's set aside the voluntary act definition and move on to the next one, which does not have the problems uh, faced by the voluntary act definition. And this is uh, what I call the declaration definition. And this says that an act X of an agent A is an exercise of a normative power if and only if it brings about a change in the normative situation by intentionally commu communicating the agent's intention to do so. And this definition have been, has been offered by David Owens, but I think is also not, not stated in exactly this way, but a very similar way um, being defended in a recent paper by Victor Tabros. Now, this definition clearly does not have the problems of the voluntary act definition, because if we think about the counterexamples offered there, they don't um, fit the requirements of the declaration definition. Um, punching someone in the face, stepping onto the street, don't involve a change in normative situation through the intentional communication of, in so doing, changing the normative situation. So, uh, some difficulties seem to be avoided, and again, many paradigmatic cases of normative powers like promising and um, consenting and commanding and so on appear uh, to be exercised through the intentional communi uh, communication of the intention, thereby doing so. However, the problem with the declaration definition is that it's not neutral. So think, for instance, about the debate on the ontology of consent. Now, some theorists think that all you need for consent is just a, a mental act, some, something that happens in your mind, um, could be an intention or some other act of willing, but no communication at all. Others, uh, for instance, think that intention is not always necessary for the exercise of normative powers such as consent. So you could have a plausible um, account of consent under which Say, remember the um, earlier example that I gave about Anna asking John uh, for the pen and John uh, smiling and nodding. Perhaps by smiling and nodding, John um, was not intending to give consent. He did it somewhat absent-mindedly, but it doesn't seem crazy to say, well, in so doing, it still gave Anna a permission to, um, to take the pen, even if he didn't intend to do so. And there are uh, some views that suggest that uh, this is indeed the case. So the fact that uh, for Owens, the intentional communication, uh, intentional communication is necessary and sufficient for the exercise of a normative power violates the neutrality criterion. And for this reason, I think the definition does not do for our purposes because it preempts our answers to the ontological question already. And so it's controversial in a way that ideally we would want to avoid. Then let me move on to the desirability definition. And this has been recently offered by Joseph Raz. And Raz says, a person's act is an exercise of a normative power if it brings about a normative change because it is, all things considered, desirable that that person should be able to bring the change about by performing the act. Now, I think that on the one hand, the desirability definition seems superficially appealing. I you know, will in some way or other come back to it uh, in later portions of the talk, but I think that for our purposes, again, it doesn't do. Um, in particular, the desirability definition fails the versatility criterion. And the reason is this, that there exist many legal and conventional powers that are clearly undesirable. So think about the legal powers of masters vis-a-vis -vis slaves in a slave society. And yet, they seem to precisely have the same structure of other things that we call normative powers that seem very desirable. So for instance, think about the authority of a teacher vis-a-vis -vis the, the pupils. I mean, structurally speaking, the phenomenon in question seems very similar. You know, By issuing certain kinds of commands, the um, master can obligate the slaves, legally speaking, and by issuing certain directive, the teacher can um, obligate the pupil, both, uh, we might think morally speaking, but as well as a matter of social fact. Um, and yet, you know, the desirability definition would suggest that the, while the teacher has the normative power, the slave, sorry, the, the master doesn't have the power vis-a-vis -vis the slave. And that seems problematic because 
uh, the desirability definition only gives us an account of what we might call moral normative powers, but is not um, versatile enough to make sense of the structural commonalities between moral normative powers and other phenomena that we might still want to call normative powers, for instance, legal and uh, other social powers that uh, have the same structure but are not very desirable. And so, whoops, I think for this... For this reason, we should move on to look for another definition. I should say, um, just uh, for transparency, I don't think that the objections that I raise in relation to each view are the only objections that can be raised in relation to each view. But for each of them, I am picking a different failure to satisfy one of the desiderata for illustrative purposes, because I think that's useful. For instance, I think the desirability definition has other problems as well, but I'm focusing on versatility because fit and neutrality have already been discussed in relation to other views and so on and so forth, just as a parenthesis. Okay, finally, un the unmediated willing definition, which has been recently proposed by Ruth Chang and from which I think I've actually learned a lot, even if I ultimately don't think it works. So to introduce this definition, um, it's important to highlight that Chang distinguishes between what she calls anemic normative powers and robust ones. So anemic normative powers are, in her own words, powers to fulfill the triggering condition of a normative principle. For instance, the punching someone in the face uh, is an example of this. So if you punch someone in the face, you then acquire duties to make amends. Um, you know, if you punch the person in the face, you're thereby triggering uh, the uh, subsequent normative principle that places obligations to make amends on you. There are then robust normative powers, and these are powers to endow a consideration with the normativity of a reason in an unmediated manner, not via triggering. So the idea is that with robust normative powers, which are actually what are typically called normative powers, the way we change the normative situation in a, is in a way much deeper than in the case of so-called anemic normative powers. It's not that there is an independent normative principle, and then we do we perform some empirical act and we activate the pre-existing normative principle. No, 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 there's no mediation from a pre-existing normative principle. We just have a power to endow a consideration with the normativity of a reason to change the normative facts in this unmediated manner, not via triggering. And Chang believes that under appropriate conditions, acts of willing can amount to exercises of robust normative powers. So that's why I call her view the unmediated willing definition. So on her view, an act X of an agent A is an exercise of a normative power, if and only if it brings about a change in the normative situation simply by the person's willing the relevant change. And in fact, she says this is a metaphysical grounding, a chance says, of normative powers, not a um, normative grounding of normative powers because there's no mediating normative principle doing any work. It's just the will all by itself. Now, as I anticipated, I think there's a lot we can learn from Chang's account, and hopefully that will emerge in the slides that follow. But I think there's a sort of pretty macroscopic problem with her definition that it seems to me to rely on a somewhat mysterious mechanism. So it is just somewhat unclear to me how an act of willing, just all by itself, can almost magically <laughs> Uh, via some kind of normative hocus pocus, bring about a change in normative situation. And the lingering suspicion is always going to be actually, there is always at the back some independent uh, normative principle of the triggering variety that picks out acts of willing as the relevant triggers for some normative consequence. It's not even clear to me how you can completely exclude that possibility. So this and we get it through simple willing uh, type declaration strikes me as a little bit mysterious. And so for this reason, to the extent that we get a certain kind of distinctiveness here, but at the cost of mysteriousness, I don't think we should be fully satisfied with the definition. And also, given that the definition sees willing as necessary for the exercise of normative powers, it's also at odds with those ontological views that don't 
regard intention or willing as always necessary for the exercise of normative powers, and so it's also not ideal in terms of neutrality. Okay, so now we come to the definition that I favor, and this is the constitutive definition, and in order to introduce it to you, let me um, sort of sum up some of the things that we've learned up to this point, the main lesson actually coming from Chang's view uh, itself. So we have seen that there are two ways to change the normative situation. One is via triggering. And I think the best way of trying to characterize the idea of triggering is um, in terms of activating or deactivating odds by fulfilling the triggering conditions of independent normative principles or rules. So for instance, I have an obligation to apologize and make amends if I punch you unjustly. Uh, what this means is if I engage in a particular activity, punching you under certain conditions, I thereby trigger or activate that obligation. The normative materials were already there in this independent principle. I don't create a new obligation from scratch, so to say, but I just activate it. Similarly, by apologizing and making amends after punching you, I don't cancel the obligation to apologize and make amends. I fulfill it, and in so doing, it's as if I was switching it off. I deactivate it. Yeah, so I untrigger it, if one can say that. And then there is a second alleged way of changing the normative situation, one that we have to presume if normative powers are to be an independently normatively interesting phenomenon, that is via true robust normative powers. And this involves creating new odds, for instance, through promising or through commands, or canceling existing ones through consent or forgiveness, not triggering pre-existing normative stuff, uh, excuse the um, informal nature of the language I'm uh, using now, through some action of ours, but through some action of ours, really creating something new or canceling something that existed. And so on this interpretation, by promising to meet you for lunch, I create a new ought for me and a new right for you. I don't just activate some pre-existing ought and right. Or by forgiving you after you've punched me, I make you no longer blameworthy and cancel your duty to make amends. It's not that the duty is being fulfilled and thereby switched off. So the change in normative situation is in a sense deeper than what goes on by a triggering. Now, the trouble is that um, while I have offered a kind of structural difference between triggering and normative powers, one needs to come up with some kind of non-mysterious account of how it's possible, through what type of mechanism could this creation and cancelling take place. Like in the case of triggering, there are these independent principles that are uh, sort of explanatory necessary to... Uh, illuminate how the change comes about, what about normative powers? We don't want to have to just stipulate, well, it's an act of will because it's just not very satisfactory. How could an act of will by itself do that? And so I don't think uh, in order to vindicate normative powers, we need to necessarily presuppose something magical. I think that both triggering and the exercise of normative powers are possible by virtue of rules. It's just the rules that are in play in each of these two cases are of a different kind. And here, to make the claim, I am going to rely on and borrow some insights from uh, John Searle. So, and particularly the insight that I want to borrow is this distinction between regulative rules on the one hand and constitutive rules on the other. So, I want to suggest that triggering presupposes what he calls regulative rules. And these are rules that regulate normatively neutral activities that we can define independently of the rules. So a typical example is driving. I mean, driving is an activity when we use the idea of driving, we're not implying, I guess, anything normative about it. It's just a particular activity that we perform. And then there's a bunch of rules that regulate the activity of driving of this form. You know, if you drive, then you should not exceed a speed of X. And then if you exceed a speed of X while driving, then you ought to pay a fine, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if you engage in the activity, there's an imperative that says don't exceed the speed. And then if you exceed the speed, there's another one that says pay the fine and so on and so forth. Now, violations of the prescriptions or prohibitions that are contained in regulative rules 
typically result in impermissible acts. So you still engage in the relevant activity, say driving, but you do so in a way that is impermissible if you violate the prescription and prohibition of the regulative rules. And so this is the typical uh, shape of regulative rules. And we can see how what Searle calls regulative rules have precisely the structure of those independent normative principles that, to use Chang vocabulary, we uh, trigger when we engage in the relevant activities. Um, well, in this case, it's driving, punching someone in some of the examples that I offered earlier. Now, normative powers on the hand presuppose, I want to suggest, constitutive rules. And these are rules that not just regulate, but constitute activities that we cannot really define independently of the rules. And the rules typically take the form X counts as Y in context C. This is a sort of famous Searle formulation. So here is an example of an activity that seems to fit the case of constitutive rules. Football. So there wouldn't really be a practice or an activity of playing football in the absence of the rules of football in the same way in which there would be an activity of driving in the absence of the regulative rules that uh, prescribe how one should drive in order to do so permissibly. So, and if we look at the rule of football, very uh, often these take precisely the form X counts as Y in C. So kicking a ball into a net under such and such conditions, the rule of football say, uh, which I do not know very well, so that's why I say under such and such conditions, counts as scoring a goal. And if the rules are not being followed, then one is not really engaging in the relevant activity. There is no goal scoring without the rules of football. And if you don't follow those rules, it's not that you scored a goal impermissibly. You just have not scored a goal in the first place. It's not valid. You've not done the thing scoring a goal that you wanted to do. So failures to follow the rules result in no longer engaging in the relevant activity. So in this case, no longer playing football. If you start sort of throwing the ball with your hands, you're no longer playing football. Um, if you, I suppose, this is just coming off the top of my head right now, I suppose if you're driving with your feet rather than your hands, it still looks like you're driving, you're just not doing so permissibly. Okay, so I want to suggest that while triggering occurs, as I said, via regulative rules, um, the exercise of normative powers is made possible by the existence of constitutive rules. So these rules, we can say, set out the recipes we need to follow in order to create new orts or cancel existing ones. And the acts that are set out in those recipes, if we perform them, constitute change in changes in the normative situation. They count as those changes in normative situations. So when we make a promise in saying, I promise under such and such conditions, we thereby create a new obligation for ourselves and a right for the promisee that didn't exist before. We don't thereby engage in some sort of normatively neutral independent activity, the regulation of which somehow via some independent regulative principle results in the creation of the obligation. Uh, somehow, it's the very act of saying I promise that constitutes the change in the normative situation. So, um, I think that what I just said in the case of promising can be said in relation to other um, paradigmatic cases of normative powers. And so, I'm just going to go through them. Promising, we can characterize as follows. So, a given action X of an agent A counts as uh, a is binding herself to another in a certain context C. This is what promising is all about. Or consenting, a given action X of an agent A counts as giving permission to another in context C. Or ordering, a given action X of an agent A counts as placing an obligation of another in context C. Or forgiving, pardoning, a given action X of an agent A counts as removing the appropriateness of blame and or punishment in a particular context and or extinguishes duties to apologize and compensate. It depends on how rich you think for forgiveness really is as a normative power. And for my purposes, it doesn't really matter. So 
I think we can understand uh, normative powers as being made possible by constitutive rules and therefore as taking the structure that is typically that is typical of constitutive rules uh, that is a counter structure. So to sum up what I said to this up to this point, this leads me to the constitutive definition of normative powers, which says that an act X of an agent A is an exercise of a normative power if and only if X counts as a change in normative situation. And how X could count as a change in normative situation depends on the existence of prior constitutive rules. It's not um, sort of a matter of normative focus focus. So, this is what the constitutive definition is all about. Let me now try to see how it fares in relation to the various desiderata that I set out at the outset. And I think it does pretty well, as you can imagine, otherwise I would not have uh, presented it. So in terms of fit, the constitutive definition does not overgenerate normative powers because um, it precisely avoids the kinds of counterexamples that we saw plague the voluntary act definition by distinguishing between triggering, which is excluded in the case of normative powers, and focusing on constitutive rules and how they enable a particularly deep change in normative situation through our actions. Then there's uh, normative distinctiveness. And again, I think the definition points to a distinctive normative phenomenon different from triggering and in a way that is not as mysterious, I think, as what Chuck was proposing because a mechanism is laid out for how such deeper normative changes could come about. There are rules in the background as well. They're just rules that are structurally different. They are constitutive rather than regulative rules. Then neutrality, I think the constitutive definition being silent on what kind of act X counts as this or that change in normative situation meets neutrality. It is, um, you know, in its form, non-committal with respect to whether you need intention, you need intention plus communication, just communication or something else. And then finally, it's versatile because the structure of the definition is compatible with legal, moral and conventional domains. So um, we might say that what act X is an exercise of this or that normative power that is counts as this or that change in normative situation will vary depending on whether we're looking at the constitutive rules that exist, um, you know, at the legal level, at the social level, or possibly at the moral level. So again, the definition seems to meet the criterion of versatility. And so I think it provides um, satisfactory starting point for thinking about then what it takes to exercise normative powers and possess them, which brings me to the second part of the talk, which will be shorter, on the ontology of normative powers. So, first of all, let me distinguish between de facto and moral normative powers. I'll take a second break to drink some water. I don't know whether you can see me, so that's why I'm saying it. If you can see me, that was unnecessary. So, um, as I anticipated, depending on the domain in question, legal, conventional, or moral, the existence conditions of normative powers will vary. Now, I'm going to say something very brief about uh, what I call de facto normative powers, that is, the powers that we have as a legal or conventional matter. Now, their existence will depend on the constitutive rules that exist as a matter of social fact that is, that are widely accepted as a matter of common knowledge within the relevant population. And, you know, there's a variety of different accounts of what de facto rules, um, or the existence conditions of de facto rules themselves. Um, here, I'm just using a very broad one, uh, coupling acceptance and common knowledge. Which attitudes make up the idea of acceptance varies depending on the theorists one looks at, um, you know, beliefs, desires, intentions, there's all of a variety of different views. These don't matter for my purposes, so one can plug in whatever one prefers, and just as a little parenthesis. What matters is that the rules are accepted as a matter of common knowledge in the uh, context at hand. Now, such rules may very well be highly morally impalatable. So we've already seen the rules of slavery, which uh, constitutive rules of slavery, which endow uh, masters, for instance, with all sorts of powers 
vis-a-vis -vis slaves and deprive slaves of all sorts of powers vis-a-vis -vis masters, still we can uh, recognize them as instances of legal normative powers or lack thereof. But also um, informal norms uh, might confer or remove normative powers and do so in ways that we regard as morally undesirable. So here are a couple of examples that um, I offer in the paper and I'm mentioning here because they'll, I'll come back to them when I focus on moral normative powers that are my main uh, interest in the second part of the talk. So for instance, uh, Quill Kukla offers one particular scenario which involves a um, floor manager in a heavy machinery factory uh, called Celia, who issues polite, direct, polite directives and commands at her workers, who happen to all be male, but her workers, because they are imbued into a misogynistic culture and accept a series of background norms and assumptions, just cannot see those polite um, directives as directives or commands. Since Celia is a woman, they just assume, because of the background norms that operate in the context of existence, that she can't issue commands, and so they understand her intended commands as requests instead. And in fact, because of those background social norms, Celia basically is deprived of the normative power to genuinely issue commands as a de facto matter that she ought to have. So her commands are being turned into requests, and as a result of that, uh, there is quite a lot of non-compliance, and when she insists, she's being perceived as, I'm not going to use the word because it's not a very polite one, but, you know, a very, let's call her, annoying woman who insists and is not grateful, and so on and so forth. And so she is being deprived by background social norms of a normative power that, morally speaking, she ought to have. Uh, or we can think of the discussions that occur uh, quite frequently in the feminist literature of how pornography in conjunction with broader patriarchal norms may deprive women of the power to refuse consent to sexual intercourse. So if in pornography, for instance, um, women are always depicted as saying no to sex, but in fact, the scenarios are such that it's clear that they actually really desire it and what they mean is yes, this, if it percolates enough in an already sort of misogynistic and patriarchal background social structure, may end up disempowering women, removing their ability to actually say no to sex. So when Jenna, a woman, for instance, says no to sexual intercourse in a particular context that is affected by these background norms, her no may just not count as an instance of refusal from a social fact point of view. So de facto, she would lack the normative power to refuse, even if clearly, morally speaking, she ought to. So here are some cases in which uh, conventional, uh, socially constructed normative powers do not match what uh, people, uh, normative powers ought to be from a moral point of view. Okay, so, but what about the moral domain? We've seen uh, what the existence conditions of de facto normative powers are, what about moral powers? Now here I think we can distinguish between two families of views, what we call practice dependent views, or we could also call them de facto norm dependent view, and practice independent views, de facto norm independent views. So the first class of views basically says that moral powers are justified de facto powers. They're morally justified powers that we have as a matter of social fact, either legal or um, sort of conventional. On this view, without de facto powers, we have no moral powers. Now, there are some supporters of this view. Some details are given in the written version of the paper. But uh, the view is not so popular because it appears to come with rather unpalatable implications and counterintuitive results. So there seems to be instances in which we would want to say that Certain individuals have certain normative powers, but from a moral point of view, but the practice dependent view does not allow us to say this. So we would want to say that if a slave says to his master, don't come near me, the slave has exercised the moral power to place 
the master under an obligation not to come near him, that the slave has a certain kind of authority vis-a-vis -vis the master, even if the authority is in some way not recognized in practice. Well, on the practice dependent view, we cannot make this claim because so long as the authority is not recognized in practice, we cannot say it exists at a moral level. Again, think about the woman who has no power to consent in uh, sexual intercourse, the, the Jenna case we offered earlier. Well, in a way, what we would want to say is that she has the moral power to consent, but the power is not being recognized in practice. We would, don't want to say that she doesn't have the power altogether. But on the practice dependent view, this is not something we're allowed to say. And so practice dependent views have some difficulties. Practice independent views, on the other hand, say that an act is an exercise of a moral power if it's desirable that it is. And by this I mean if, on reflection, looking at the moral reasons and value-based reasons that bear on the case, uh, it looks like something, this act really should be an exercise of a moral power. Now, what kind of reasons might be invoked in order to make these kinds of arguments? Well, these have to do with the function of moral powers. And what do moral powers allow us to do? Well, first of all, they allow us to exercise our autonomy, to engage in meaningful relationships. So, for instance, we might think that what's special about the relationship between monogamous partners is that they grant each other certain exclusive rights to intimate contact with each other. Uh, we might think that what's special about friendship is the way in which uh, friends commit to one another, thereby exercising their normative powers. And we might even think that part of what's special about the relationship between a child and their parents and vice versa uh, is constituted by the authority that parents have vis-a-vis um, -vis their children, that something would be missing from that relationship if, if there wasn't authority. I'm not saying that that's all there is to that relationship, but an important feature of that relationship that adds value to that relationship is uh, authority. And in excuse general... Me, uh, Laura, excuse me, I have to exercise my normative powers. No, it's fine. I, you ask me to give you the time. You still more or less 10 minutes. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. Uh, consistent with what my watch says. Thank you. Okay, sorry. Okay. No, 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 you don't need to apologize. It was, uh, I was just saying, thank God, it looks like I've got it under control. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> So, um, and in general, uh, normative powers allow us, including moral powers, of course, to um, hold each other to account in a variety of ways and also to change our accountability relations by exercising them. Because by changing normative facts, we change our accountability relations. And, you know, they're valuable for all of these reasons. And so on this view, what should count as the exercise of this or that power depends on what best serves the values or the function of this or that power. In this sense, it depends on what it's desirable. And, you know, if you look at some of the literature on normative powers, for instance, um, the one I'm possibly most familiar with is the literature on consent. Quite a lot of it seems to proceed in precisely this way, you know, given the function of consent, given why consent is valuable, that's the way in which we should think about consent, for instance. Okay, so against this backdrop, I want to argue that desirability considerations, so the kinds of considerations that are central to the practice independent view, lead us back to a practice dependent view. So it would be undesirable for moral powers to exist in the absence of corresponding de facto constitutive rules. That's what I'm going to argue. So, and this brings me basically to the last substantive section of the talk. Uh, I'm going to offer two arguments for... Uh, the desirability-based defense of practice dependence. And the first one is what I call the publicity argument. So one key function of moral powers is to allow individuals to change moral situations and thereby change the nature of the mutual accountability relations. But it's facts about when it's appropriate uh, for them to blame, resent, demand things of one another. Uh, that's what it means to change the normative situation. You know, once a promise has been made, I can hold you to account if you don't fulfill the promise. Once a permission has been given, consent has been given, then I can no longer complain or demand that you don't do the thing that I consented that you would do, etc., etc. Now, for this to be the case, the exercise of a normative power has to be duly public or accessible to those in the context at hand, to the parties involved. 
So we need some kind of intersubjective fact of the matter as to when a given power has been exercised, hence when the normative situation has been changed. It has to be, you know, in principle possible for people to see um, that the normative situation has been changed. Otherwise, there would be something very odd about holding them to account for something that they could not have in any way seen or understood. So, you know, it'd be very odd for me to hold my friend to account for not following my order if I had not actually verbally issued that order in the presence of my friend or, you know, not sent them a note or something like that. Of, of course, it shouldn't be my friend, it should be my employee, <laughs> given that you don't normally give orders to, to friends. That was not the best chosen example, but you know what I mean. So the issue is that morality alone, it seems to me, cannot tell us what that something is, what um, you know, what it takes to exercise, what something needs to be done, what that something that needs to be done is in order to exercise this or that power, because there are in principle several equally desirable ways of exercising different normative powers. So while we may expect any morally decent person to reason their way to the conclusion that killing the innocent is wrong, it doesn't seem to me like we can reason our way to what counts as consenting, promising, or ordering in a living context, absent some existing convention that picks out a particular act as performing this function. So, you know, there are some conventional ways in which we issue orders, uh, for instance, um, through a certain tone of voice or by being in a particular kind of authoritative position such that uh, the rules of the game specify that a certain type of utterance, even if not uh, stated in the imperative form, does count as an order, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are the ways in which we typically issue orders. Now, it's not the case that if we point to something and start jumping up and down, we're thereby issuing an order. If we were to do that with the intention of issuing an order, we would fail, even if we had the authority, I suspect. And the reason is just that that particular behavior, at least based on our background rules, the ones that we tend to accept, we could imagine a parallel world in which this is the way you issue orders, just, not, just doesn't count as ordering. And so for that reason, sorry, I want to go back for a second. Uh, it seems to me that we need norms that are accepted as a matter of common knowledge in order for um, the exercise of normative powers to meet the publicity condition, which is in turn necessary for the powers to meaningfully play the function that they're supposed to play, that is, allow us to change our mutual accountability relations. Uh, and it would therefore be highly undesirable if the publicity condition wasn't met, because we live in a world in which um, you know, the normative situation could be changed all the time and we would have no way of being aware of it uh, in the way in which it would be undesirable if we could be placed under all sorts of obligations, say, uh, just through others desiring uh, for us to be placed under those obligations, but without ever being told. It would be really undesirable if that was the case. All right, so we need publicity and for publicity, we, we need de facto norms. And then the second argument is what I call the making a different argument, difference argument. And the idea here is just what is desirable about possessing moral power when possession of it makes no difference to anyone's lives. So this is a thought that is also expressed by David Owens, who says, well, whether what is in question is the ability to make friends or forgive wrongdoers, or else a normative power like the power to promise or to consent, Possession of this ability or power does us no good unless it is recognized in some form. So what's good about having these sort of ethereal moral powers if there is no kind of empirical counterpart of them? Now recall the earlier examples. Jenna says no to sexual advances, but she socially lacks the power to refuse consent. She's silenced by existing conventions. Or Celia, the floor manager, who intends to issue a directive, but the background social norms turn it into a request. Now, in one sense, would it be desirable for these individuals, for Jenny and Celia, for example, to have the moral power to consent and command? So what's good about postulating that they have the moral power when they don't have the corresponding de facto power? And I think a very tempting answer here is that, well, unless we postulate that they have exercise the moral, the relevant moral powers of consent and um, command, 
then we can't explain what's wrong with their situations. Uh, so it looks like there's some important wrongdoing that remains unaccounted for. And so for explanatory purposes, we need to postulate that they have these moral powers. I don't think that's necessary. This is the last substantive point I'll make. So we can make sense of the wrong suffered by Jenna and Celia without postulating moral powers. Why? Because in the case of Jenna, her lacking the power to consent makes it the case that sexual interaction with her is wrong. Uh, why? Because it's wrong to sexually interact with other agents if they're not given her their consent. And if she lacks the power, then you can't uh, you know, have sex with her. Um, and also, in this particular uh, way of characterizing the wrong, we can say that the wrong is even deeper. Because it's not just the case that, you know, she exercises the power she possesses, it's just that people ignore it, uh, they violate uh, the uh, obligation that she places on them. The wrong is even deeper because she's structurally prevented from even having the power in the first place. So in a way, her deprivation is even greater. We can still make the argument that she ought to have the power for all sorts of reasons that have to do with independent values, but we don't need to add another piece, another entity to our normative ontology that is this independent moral power in order to make that argument. And Celia, I think, is also wronged, but what explains the wrong that Celia is a victim of is the misogynistic norms that are supported by her worker. The, law, the wrong doesn't lie in the workers disobeying her would-be orders, which do not count as orders in the relevant context, but in her workers supporting a set of norms that prevents her from uh, issuing those orders and thereby disempowers her in this way, when in fact we have all sorts of moral reasons we can appeal to in order to claim that she ought to have those powers. So I still think we can make sense of the wrong, we just diagnose the wrong slightly differently, and in a way that I think um, brings out the full scale of the gravity of the wrong. So, uh, yeah, I, I think that desirability still is on the side of practice dependence. So to conclude, I've offered a definition of normative powers, the constitutive definition. I have then argued that even moral normative powers are practice dependent when I turn to the ontology or existence conditions of uh, normative powers. Now, one last uh, observation that I want to make is that practice dependence per se doesn't commit us to a particular view about the content of the relevant de facto constitutive norms. So practice dependence is, at least as I've presented it, in principle neutral with respect to what exactly it the content of the relevant de facto norms should be. But it does suggest that when asking what it takes to consent or promise or command, what we need to think about is what norms would best realize the values that are behind these powers. So that to some extent, maybe when we think about normative powers, what we really should be thinking of is something like, I mean, I'm putting it a bit metaphorically, institutional design, uh, maybe a lot more than some moral theorists uh, seem to suggest when they discuss normative powers. Okay, and on this note, I conclude. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions, and I hope I can now stop sharing so I can see where people are and what they're up to, and uh, stop presenting. Okay, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. So the cameraman, Jonathan, can stop the recording. And what we will do now, we will have like five minutes break or something like that. And then we come back for the Q&A. So my watch and your watch is uh, signs 333. We come back at 338.